right, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here for the first ever experimental Toastmaster session at Pomona College and at the Pomona College Museum of Art. Very excited to be here with Mark Allens. Uh, what, what, oh shoot, I didn't even ask what was this junior senior seminar? Yes, the junior senior seminar. Can we have a hand for the junior senior seminar? Um, this is a fabulous group of folks who I've met before in a previous instance, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say today as part of this. Um, I encourage you to, um, to use this opportunity to, to, to do whatever you need to do um, on the mic. So um, uh, as, a, as a, just a quick announcement, um, today this is part of a, lar a larger series of events today at BESHT. Um, we're going to... Um, uh, this evening we have a really fabulous program set aside for uh, for gallery visitors and uh, community members. We have the um, uh, Diction for Dollars, which will begin promptly at 5 p.m. and run until 7.30, where any of you and any other visitors or friends can earn a dollar a minute um, to speak up here at the lectern. You can earn up to $20.00. And tonight, um, it's slightly different. We're gonna have an abbreviated session. It will only be from 5 to 7.30, and we won't have a second half. So make sure if you're interested, you plan to be here for the first half. Um, and then after that, starting at 8, we're gonna have a guided meditation marathon featuring a bunch of really wonderful experimental writers and artists. Um, uh, th uh, three, uh, th there'll be three guided meditations. Each, each around, they'll each be around, I think, th uh, 30 to 45 minutes, I think. Um, and uh, we, also, uh, we also got a brand new uh, issue number four in the mail today, um, or maybe yesterday. So be sure to pick one up before you leave. It's a really fantastic um, issue with a lot of fun text by a lot of wonderful folks. So, well, without further ado, um, I would love to kick this off um, by inviting up uh, Marisa, the invocation master, to give us her invocation. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, Salt and Peppa and Heavy D up in the limousine. Hanging pictures on my wall every Saturday, uh, Rap Attack, Mr. Magic, Marley Marl. I left my tape rock till my tape popped. Oh well, that's everything I'm not concerning. Fuck it. I'm on the top floor getting brains, higher learning. You never thought that Toastmasters would take it this far. Now I'm in the limelight, because I rhyme with tight. I bomb atomically Socrates' philosophies and hypotheses can't define how I be dropping these mockeries, lyrically perform armed robbery. You know very well who you are. Don't let them hold you down. Reach for the stars. You had a goal, but not that many, not that many. We ain't going nowhere. No, we ain't going nowhere. We can't be stopped now, because this bad boy for life. California knows how to party. California knows how to party. In the city of LA, in the city of good old Watts, in the city, the city of Claremont, we keep it rocking. We keep it rocking. <laughs> Throw up a finger if you feel the same way. Dorn putting it down for you, California. Throw it up, y'all. Throw it up. Throw it up. Let's show these fools how we do this on that west side. Because you and I know it's the best side. If you don't know, now you know. Yeah, yeah, yo, yeah. It ain't shit changed since the notorious 
We miss you, B.I.G. I'd like to do a short prayer for Biggie. Everyone together with me. Um shini wam um shini wam. 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 What a fantastic start. I feel refreshed and ready to go. Thank you so much. Um, next up, um, we're gonna, uh, we'd, I'd like to introduce our grammarian, um, who, uh, uh, Justina, who will be presenting our word of the day. Hello. Um, so, instead of a word of the day, I decided that we were going to try and utilize an idiom of the day. Um, so basically, I was looking, I was interested in this when I was looking through some books and I was trying to find some of the idioms that I recognized or didn't recognize. And so I have kind of a list that I wrote down um, of things that I thought might be idioms because I wasn't sure with some of them. So uh, like on the dole, pray for rain, on the needle, by the dozen, um, cold to it. And then I realized I wrote down one that was the goose lay low. And then I was looking through this list and I didn't know what that meant. And then I realized that I had made that up because it was just lay low would be the idiom. And I just added the goose part because I thought it sounded, it also didn't make sense to me. Um, so then at my house over Thanksgiving, I found this book of English idioms and I was flipping through it and I found some um, interesting quotes and just some interesting examples of idioms. So how they're used metaphorically and when they're used, uh, like the words make sense or the words mean one thing on their own and then they mean another thing as an idiom. Um, so an example uh, would be, and also I thought it was interesting the way that the idioms kind of fall in and out of fashion. So I found one that was called, it was like to play gooseberry, which I think is the equivalent of us saying uh, to play third wheel um, to something. So I guess that used to be a thing that people would say. Um, and I, <laughs> I think the one that we're gonna try to use um, today was is one that's um, it's uh, a fine kettle of fish, which I don't know is anyone familiar with that idiom or has has anyone heard that before? Yeah, what 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 do you think or what did you think it means? I think it means like like because you're in a bad situation. Like it's literally just like a refined Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm glad someone <laughs> knew it. <laughs> um, so according to this. Uh, it is a state of affairs that is confused, difficult, or different from expected. Um, and then an example of it would be, when he came back from holiday, he found all the roses had died. Well, this is a fine kettle of fish, he said. Um, and then it says, it gives a little context, and it says, it is probably based on a humorous comparison between a large, noisy outdoor party where fish were cooked and served and a confused state of affairs. And you can also use the words pretty or different instead of fine if you'd like. And then if you want, you can also utilize the phrase literally if you just wanna use some, pour some tea or something. So, a fine kettle of fish. What a fantastic idiom of the day. Thank you so much, uh, Justina. We're gonna go ahead and kick off the, uh, the uh, lectures of the day. We, um, we have four speakers, and the first one will be 
Adam, who will be um, presenting Reading My Art History Textbook. Hi, I'm Adam. Don't get me wrong, I, unlike most speeches, today I will aspire to make the worst speech ever. Barring any other speakers intending to do the same, I intend to win this contest by default, because all my failures will be successes. My hand shakes. I think of ways to save face. I transition into a graceful swinging, as if batting away a menacing fruit fly. I smile. I have succeeded in saving face. I will start off with the joke because I heard that it is good to start with a joke. As such, I've selected a few gut-bursting jokes by Jack Handy. Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. The crows seem to be calling his name, thought Call. Deep Thought by Jack Handy. I think to myself, wow, that joke failed miserably. Semi-expected. I carry on. I expected to win over the audience, so I will proceed from my notes where I have assumed winning over the audience. Now that I have won over the audience, the imminent total embarrassment of the rest of my speech should not affect their positive view of me, I hope. I have chosen to read my art history textbook as I thought I could kill two birds with one stone. I'm two chapters behind. <laughs> when Louis the 18th, who reigned 1814 to 24, assumed the throne of France after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815. He could not ignore the reforms implemented by both the revolution and Napoleon himself. As you can tell, I'm reading with my trademark charisma. <laughs> His younger brother, the Count of Artois, disagreed and almost immediately a so-called ultra-royalist movement composed of families who had suffered at the hands of the revolution established itself. I'm so bored that I have thoughts of killing myself so that I can enter the afterlife and permanently assassinate the author of this textbook from eternity. I continue. Advocating the return of their confiscated estates and the abolition of revolutionary and Napoleonic reforms, the ultra royalists imprisoned and executed hundreds of revolutionaries. I can tell that I am losing the audience, so I will proceed to read another joke by Jack Handy. Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. Whenever I see an old lady slip and fall on a wet sidewalk, my first instinct is to laugh. But then I think, what if I was an aunt and she fell on me? Then it wouldn't seem quite so funny. Deep thoughts by Jack Handy. I continue to read the textbook. My morale is supremely low. Bonaparte, Bonaparte sympathizers and Protestant 
in southern France. I know where I am. Where I am. Jack Louis da David, who had supported Napoleon, was in exile during this period. In order to solidify his control, Louis dissolved the largely ultra-royalist chamber of deputies and called for new elections, which resulted in a more modern majority. As I read, I'm drawn to the painting on the left of my textbook. As a heterosexual man, I'm uncontrollably drawn to the woman's breasts. Stop, I tell myself. You stupid, uncouth, primate, medieval brain, <laughs> I tell myself. As I say this, I'm still staring at the breasts. <laughs> They're rather uninspiring. I continue to read. Relative calm prevailed in France for the next four years, when in February 1820, the son of the Count of Artois, who was the last of the Bourbons, Bourbons and heir to the throne, was assassinated, initiating 10 years of repression. The education system was placed under the control of Roman Catholic bishops, press censorship was inaugurated, and dangerous political activity banned. You would have thought they would have banned dangerous political activity much before this time. At the death of Louis XVIII, the Count of Artois assumed the throne as Charles X, who reigned 1824 to 1830. I must artificially try to gain your interest with another joke by Jack Handy. Deep thoughts by Jack Handy. I hope some animal never bores a hole in my head and lays its eggs in my brain. Because later you might think you're having a good idea, but it's just eggs hatching. Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. In the midst of this turmoil at the Salon of 1824, a young painter by the name of Eugene Delacroix who lived from 1798 to 1863, exhibited a large painting entitled Scenes from the Massacre at Chios. This makes me wonder. I always see the years people have lived. And I always wonder, those years never tell me anything about them. When I die, I want, I want people to say, to write me, uh, to write about me as Adam Chung, 1990 to 2200, Charisma Machine. I look at the figure that the text is pointing me to. I scoff at the painter's poor rendering. What a badly painted dog, I think. It looks like a horse. I soon realized that it actually is, in fact, a horse. I try to hide my face from the audience and of embarrassment. If I, had, if I had more time, I would tell more jokes, but I've got to get off the stage. So thank you for being such a wonderful audience. I hope you all live forever. Excellent talk. We really appreciate it. Um, up next is our second speaker, Jean, who will be presenting her talk, Languages. Please welcome Jean. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. I hope you can all hear me all right. If you don't, actually, that's not really going to matter. So, um, OK. Oh, I just have the paper upside down. That's stupid. Um,大家好,其实,这个场合讲完,其实我都觉得有点小小紧张啦。这次呢,就是想讲一些关于我自己的东西咯。我其实很小的开始呢,就一直想成为一个艺术家。其实这个想法都有点 
誒、呃、奇尼咯，因為我覺得誒、呃、其實我細個嗰陣時咧，即係有啲肥啊，同埋誒都唔係幾得意啦，加埋誒、呃、都有啲傻懵懵嘅，所以好多時候我都覺得唔係好，即係唔係好中意我自己所生活嘅呢個時界咯。誒、呃，但係咧，誒、呃、我知道自己有一樣嘢好叻，即、就、係、是、我識得點樣畫畫，咁我覺得。誒、呃、我自己即係成長呢個過程之中咧，藝術一直都俾咗我好多，即、就、係、是、對於自己嘅信心，同埋令到我對呢個世界嘅看法都有好大嘅，同埋好機智嘅改觀。誒、呃，其實有啲時候咧，尤其係而家即係咪即係日日都諗啲關於即今後即係生活嘅嘢咧，其實都覺得可能即係作為一個藝術家，即、就、係、是、生活都會好辛苦咯。誒、呃，但係都覺得呢、這個即係打運嚟講，都係自己誒細個開始嘅一個夢想。如果唔去做，即係唔堅持落嚟嘅話咧，我會覺得好對唔住自己。誒、呃，所以係咁啦。嗯，こんにちは。よろしくお願いします。私は宮本由紀です。今えっととても小さい頃からいつも美術家としたいなりたいだから今大学であの美術の専攻とした。なんか実はえっと実はずっと美術家になりたいだけど今はあのクラスで毎日なんかなんか美術についての考えてしなきゃからずっとなかなか。美術は難しいことになるんでしょうね。あと、あのとても小さい頃か、子供の時はいつも美術はこ,この世界の中に一番ものすごい楽しくて、もう安いことと考えてし,してるんから、今は実ねえっと時々本当に美術家になれるかなって思い出してビクビクした。でもこのとにかくこの美術家と美術だけになりすとは人生の一番大切な夢だからあのこの夢のために一生懸命で頑張ってるた多分いつかに本当に美術家美術美術家にあ美術家になりたるんできるでしょうか。もういつかにあのあと素晴らしい美術家使ってる、欲しいている。まあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあまあ。喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵唔要猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，猫，喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵喵。嗯 ，OK。So finally, I'm talking English again. So, um, basically, I was talking about myself, but you guys won't know what I was talking about. Um, and well, actually, it all starts with I. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting because I grew up being able to speak Cantonese and Japanese, and every time my friends learn that I can speak Cantonese and Japanese, people will always get uber excited. Like, oh, so Jing, how do you say that in Chinese? Like, 
how do you say hello in Chinese? And how do you say cat in Chinese? And how do you say to fuck in Japanese? Like people get really excited about me being able to speak these exotic languages and sometimes it's like interesting that they see it as a spectacle and sometimes it's slightly uncomfortable that people will just surround me and ask me everything like in other languages. It doesn't really seem to me that they're actually interested. It really seems like it's a like a fun game to to ask people about their culture and their language to see how weird it's gonna sound. And I think in that sense, people probably see Cantonese and Japanese no different than Miaoing. I mean, I'm sure if Miaoing is an established language and I claim I can speak it, and people ask me how, how to say fuck in Miaoing, and I tell them it's meow, and they'll be impressed as well. So um, yeah, I think there's something interesting about that. Also, I think it was just fun that I think languages are created to help people communicate, but I was talking in a, in a way to hide myself instead to really express myself to you guys. So I feel happy about that, excuse me. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, should I keep on talking? Do I have more time? Okay, all right. It's so funny, I actually speak uh, Meowneys and, and understood everything that you said in that <laughs> third part. Okay, don't, tell them. <laughs> don't worry, just between you and me and the, the Meowneys population at home. Um, thank you so much, Jing, for your wonderful talk. Um, next up, uh, we're going to have our third speaker, Lucas, who will be talking about Tor and the Silk Road. <laughs> Okay, so after those ridiculous presentations, I am now <laughs> going to present a very serious uh, informational PowerPoint on uh, a technology that I find very interesting and uh, central to our lives, and I think it's important that we all learn about it, as uh, there's been many efforts to keep this information hidden. So the dark net, what is the dark net? Um, the dark net, for our purposes, as I will be talking today, refers to a, a collection of hidden internet websites that are only accessible through a anonymously encrypted internet browser called Tor. So, Tor Project. Tor Project is a company that has um, basically taken on the task of anonymous internet browsing and they have created this uh, internet browser Tor and this very easy download bundle where you are able to download this browser you can put it on a USB stick and then you can take it anywhere and boot it from any computer um, externally and you can then and what it basically does is you log on from our IP address in the Pomona College Museum saying we're from here, it then sends that and triangulates it or s to, sends it to numerous different uh, locations across the world and produces a new IP address that is encrypted. And, um, and so it'll often say we are browsing, as we'll go back to the Tor browser, it says our IP address is 31172.30.3. That is not here. We could search that, but in the interest of time, I'll continue. So um, my, my lecture today is going to focus on two main websites uh, available on the, through the Tor browser, and that is the Silk Road and Tor Mail. Now um, I'll talk first about Tor Mail. Tor Mail is essentially an anonymous internet system where uh, you can basically create an email address that will be encrypted through the website and it will and you can then use that as a functioning email address but it is only accessible through the Tor network and if you have your information so that allows you to function uh, exactly like any other internet. Oh and one thing I should mention about the Tor browser is it's extremely slow particularly over a Wi-Fi connection so um, 
it's possible that we won't be able to access it today, but I have included screen caps. Um, but I'm gonna try and log on to the Silk Road at this juncture now. Okay, we'll give it some time. So this is a screen cap that I've taken. Let's see if we can um, make this bigger. So this is a screen cap from the Silk Road. Now the Silk Road, uh, as it is most commonly known for, is a underground drug marketplace where essentially uh, people from all over the world offer uh, pretty much any drug that you can imagine. So here on the front page is offering um, mertapzine and 2cc and mephedrone and sour diesel and, uh, and chewable camagra and MDMA. So, and now one thing that you'll notice, so these are all available. Uh, people can log on, they'll have a wallet uh, full of bitcoins is the currency that operates on the Silk Road and on the tour. And I'll, get, I'll talk about that more. But it basically functions uh, similar to how euros would function where you, there's an exchange rate that is um, governed by, uh, it's unclear, but um, it function, it, it's an internet-based currency and uh, there's a few differences that I'll talk about in a minute. So also available on the Silk Road. So this is the drug section of the Silk Road. There's, as you can see, here's cocaine, MDMA, coke, uh, that's mostly what they're offering, it appears on the front page, but it's, um, there's a lot on there and I don't encourage you guys to uh, explore this because I feel like um, it's somewhat untrustworthy, but it is uh, a tried and true method um, that people have been able to you use. It uses the United States Postal Service and encrypted uh, processes and you basically have it delivered to your house. But I think there's more interesting things available on the Silk Road that I think uh, are important for us to know about, uh, not necessarily to use, however. So this is the forgery section um, of the Silk Road where people offer uh, driver's licenses, um, counterfeit coupons, uh, forged social security cards. Uh, you can get a free Netflix account. Um, and here is someone offers a for $4,000 or 4,000 Bitcoins, which is the equivalent of much more or no, maybe around $5,000, you can get a UK passport, which is, um, it's pretty, I mean, I think this obviously has very sinister implications. I'm sure uh, the Silk Road is used for illegal, th I mean, beyond drugs, I'm sure that uh, the Tor browser is used for child pornography and very dark, you know, the darkest parts of the internet. But it also has these implications of um, kind of a greater freedom and, uh, it, it allows people who aren't involved in criminal activity normally to have access to this much darker uh, web where you can get a forged passport or driver's license, et cetera. Now, what I have used the Silk Road for is for their collection of books. Uh, there's an excellent selection of books, including um, zip files that have you can get all seven Harry Potter books for very cheap. You can get uh, books on meth manufacture, uh, 102 drug books, one gigabyte worth of material, the anarchist cookbook, and what I purchased most recently is a massive collection of banned and rare books. So now I'm going, I, and I'll, I'll visit those in a minute, but I'm gonna first talk about the Bitcoin currency. So BitInstant and Mt. Gox, are two websites that uh, offer Bitcoin exchange. And now, so what I have done is on BitInstant, you can do select cash deposit, pay to email, where you can go. And what I had to do is, as I will return to my show, I had to fill out, I filled out cash deposit for $20, which they then printed off this online receipt which I then took to CVS and called up on the MoneyGram. You call the phone and you say you want to pay a bill for this account, 9611, to ZipZap. You pay the bill 
uh, an hour later, you have it sent to your Tor mail email, an equivalent of $1.69 in bitcoins, which I then used to purchase a collection of banned and rare books, including Growing Marijuana, Free Electricity from the Sky, Homemade Cyanide, and Resin, Reason, and a extensive collection of occult books, including meditation, etc. So I'm out of time, but I just want to take the opportunity before I conclude my presentation. Um, it is concluded. But I just want to, so now this obviously, as I said, has very sinister implications, but I want to talk very briefly about the benefits. And I would like to advocate for a more mainstreamed use of the Silk Road and the dark net. I believe that we're in an increasing world uh, where an anonymity is equating, equates to uh, illegal activity. And I think we need to reject that and uh, retake the anonymity that is offered by these services. And uh, we can use it for our own beneficial goods and rethink how this technology can be used. But for the now, you guys know it's out there and how to use it. Thank you. Okay. much, Lucas, for that excellent talk. We really appreciate that. Um, uh, our final speaker for the, uh, for the um, main speaker section of today will be Juliet, and she'll be presenting a talk titled, When the Stars Align. Please welcome Juliet to the stage. So when I woke up this morning, it was one of those mornings when I didn't want to get out of bed. I do this thing every night where I set my alarm pretty early in order to try to get up and do homework, or maybe if I'm feeling ambitious to go for a run before I have to actually be out and, out and about for my day. And I do this the night before with the intention that maybe the next day will be one of those days when I'll be really refreshed and ready to face the world. But this happens about once a year, and today was not one of those days. So I have come up with this trick for myself that helps me um, ease back into the conscious world after I'm asleep. And that trick is to listen to really loudly, like blasting it in my room, wait for it, This American Life podcasts, or The Moth, or Radiolab. Um, and these are pretty lovely. I have found that they're the best way for me to wake up. Um, and <laughs> what could be better than listening to Ira Glass's wonderful voice as you're groggily rubbing sleep out of your eyes? So anyways, this morning I woke up and I realized that I had to come up with a speech topic. And I was listening to a story on the Moth podcast. And it happened to be a story told by an astrophysicist. and. It was a story about how she met her husband and fell in love. And hilariously, the theme for the story had been um, when, the when the stars align. I don't know if any of you guys have heard this one, but it's pretty entertaining. Um, so I told myself, oh, great. I'll just go up to this thing today, and I'll tell a story about when the stars have aligned in my life. So as I was walking to work at Sycamore Elementary and later on as I was like meeting someone for a project this morning, I was trying really hard to think about like this wonderful time in my life when everything just like went right and all the stars were aligned, but I couldn't think of any like particularly exciting story that I should tell you guys. I also realized that since I spend quite a chunk of time with you all, I'm no stranger and so I would have to come up with like a pretty exciting story in order to keep you guys entertained, which I thought might be kind of difficult. So
So I decided to tell a story about when I was a kid, as I'm fairly certain that my four-year-old self did not cross paths with any of your lives at that point. So when I was four, my parents decided to send me to the university preschool lab in Madison, Wisconsin. So yes, I was one of those children that was observed and studied and was probably in quite a few studies at that point by like psychology students and such. And I had no clue this was going on. I was so engrossed in my own little world um, that it didn't distract me to have like weird things going on sometimes. And I thought it was really normal to have a huge mirror wall. Um, and I never suspected that there were people like behind there watching my every move as I like spilled glue all over the place. Um, <laughs> But little four-year-old Juliet thought that this was the greatest place ever, and some of my first memories are actually from this preschool. So I'm going to tell you a story of one of those memories. Um, there's this one kid that went to my preschool whose name was Ezra, and I thought he was the absolutely coolest kid alive. So I would follow him around like wherever he went, <laughs> And um, I think we were friends. I don't think he got too annoyed with me. Um, and so every day at mid-morning, our teacher, Patty, would interrupt us from what we were doing, and she would all tell us to get to the table because it was snack time. So I would follow Ezra to the table, and I would sit next to him, and I would pull out my little lunch box. It was red, and it was 101 Dalmatian themed. I still remember it very vividly. And Ezra would always bring a jello, like a little jello cup for his snack, and he did this thing every single day. So we would sit down and he would open his lunchbox and take out his jello, and I would watch him as he would do this. Then he would grab his spoon and he would like take it up and like jam it into the top, and it would be open, so he wouldn't have to ask for help to open his jello. Meanwhile, I would like sit there and then I'd have to like raise my hand and have Patty come and open my yogurt or whatever I was having. And it, I realized that it was really inefficient that I couldn't do this by myself because Ezra always got to eat a snack like way before I did because I had to wait for help. So I um, decided one day that it was time to take control of the situation and therefore <laughs> I needed to learn how to open the yogurt by myself. So. We sat down for snack, and Ezra took his spoon and very gracefully opened his jello. And I sat there with my yogurt. And then I wrapped the spoon way over my head and I smashed it through the top. <laughs> and it opened it, but it ended up splattering the yogurt like all over the table, all over Ezra, and all over myself. And I got in trouble because I made a huge mess. But I was very satisfied and very proud of myself because I had done it by myself. I'm sure I was in some weird like observation in a study, like young girl attempts to copy her peer, but she's unsuccessful. But um, I felt very successful. And it made me realize that the people around us, our peers, are often the people that we learn the most from and teach us the most about what's going on in the world and how they see the world and how we could see the world as well. And I experience this every day when I go to Sycamore Elementary School. Um, elementary school. I'm a teaching assistant there. Um, it was pretty funny because this morning there's this little girl, Lauren, who's um, mildly autistic and she was not having a very good morning. Um, there was this little boy sitting at the table in her spot when we were doing, we were making little gingerbread people. It was kind of a mess. I'm sure I still have like glitter on myself somewhere. Um, and she was getting really, really frustrated because Alan was not supposed to be sitting in that spot and he was not supposed to be there. And I found her another chair and we started talking and, or I wasn't talking, they were talking to each other. And it was really interesting to hear what they had to say because Lauren all of a sudden was saying, I wish I was homeschooled. I don't like other kids sometimes. They just get in the way and they're annoying. And then the other kids started talking about what would be a good part of being homeschooled and what would be a bad part of be, about being homeschooled. And it was so interesting to hear that. And this one little girl was saying, well, if I were homeschooled, then I would be really lonely. And I was like, yeah. 
I see what you're saying. And Lauren kind of like was like, yeah, I guess so. Um, and I don't know, it was pretty interesting to hear that even at such a young age, we're able to take in so much from our peers and the people around us. And so as I was thinking about this, um, I'm completely 100% sure that in the future I will have many, many stories about my fellow art students to tell from Pomona. Um, I honestly think that I've learned just about as much from you guys as I have from professors. Uh, we're all really weird and really different, which is pretty amazing to have such a diverse group, just in terms of our ideas in one place. Um, I, I love that we have such a different definition of the area that we're studying, because art stretches across all fields, and um, you guys are shaping me into the artist that I want to be. Um, and I'm positive that in 20 years I'll have great stories to tell about like Lucas's bikes and his stills <laughs> and um, his awesomely weird projects and Adam's amazing illustrations and like Joaquin's knitting project. And I could go on and say something about all of you guys. Um, now this is getting really like cheesy and cliche, but you know, whatever. Um, and so as silly as it sounds, I often think about how crazy it is that I've met all the people in my life that I have. So many like chance instances and random happenings and like the big decisions I've made, like where my parents decided to live and like what preschool they decided to send me to and where I decided to go to college and like that I decided to be an art major all have gathered together this weird eclectic collection of people that have been a part of my life that I've interacted with. And in some ways, I guess that means that the stars have aligned in my life. So I guess we could all call this fate. So thanks for being my fellow art students, guys. Excellent. Thank you so much, Juliet. Um, thank you, Adam, Jing, uh, Lucas, and Juliet for their fabulous um, talks. Could we have another hand for the speakers? Um, so that concludes the very first portion of, of today's uh, artist run Toastmasters. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, move into the next uh, brief section, um, which will be table topics, where um, a handful of folks are asked um, some questions um, that they haven't prepared for yet. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Sarah, our table topics master for the day. So this weekend, I experienced a rather severe bout of tonsillitis, and over this winter break, I'm getting my tonsils removed, and I'm really excited about it. I want those things out, in the trash, gone forever, never to think about again. So my first question for Jenny is, is there any part of yourself, physically or spiritually, that you would remove and never look at again? this is um, a hard question to answer because um, it's hard um, to um, imagine um, any um, part of my body um, gone. Um, <laughs> but um, kind of um, going um, along um, with your tonsillitis story. Um, I um, still um, have my um, wisdom teeth um, in, and um, I have um, been um, dreading the um, day that the um, dentist would um, tell me um, that I um, would have to um, 
get um, those removed. So um, I guess if I um, had to um, choose a um, part um, of my body that um, I would um, have um, removed, I think um, it um, would be um, that. So <laughs> um, that I um, would not um, have to um, go through um, that um, procedure um, ever. <laughs> Uh, my next question is for Nicole. I grew up having a terrible fear of avocados, not just a disliking, but a phobia to the point where if I had an avocado in my hand and I had to cut it, I would feel like I was going to throw up. And I came to college and started working at the Coop Fountain and had to cut hundreds and hundreds of avocados. And finally, I was like, fuck this. I can't deal with this phobia, I have to get over it. I have to just start eating avocados and I better like them. And now, in fact, they are by far my favorite food. So my question for you is, have you ever had a phobia or do you have one now? And if it's changed, why? Um, so, <laughs> I do have a phobia, in fact. Um, ever since I was young, I always what, I would always get very nervous and anxious uh, when I was in a tight space. So I have claustrophobia, a mild case of it. Um, so even to this day, um, I get very nervous when people are around me or if I'm in a crowd. I don't particularly like elevators. Um, when I was younger, because of this, I would be really bad at playing uh, hide-and-go-seek. <laughs> And uh, so I would always hide in like the most obvious places. I w couldn't just hide in small enclosed areas. So I would always be one of the first ones out and I would always be the it person. And um, as for getting over it, I think I just avoid tight areas in general. I <laughs> haven't <laughs> really uh, gone over it. So, yeah, I have, I try not to, yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> uh, and my final question is for Marissa. I, sometimes when I'm driving, and I'm really fed up with all the CDs in my car and all the things in the radio. I just turn off the radio and start talking to myself. But like not just reflecting talking to myself, but actually having conversations like sort of back and forth and like asking myself questions out loud. And for me, I really enjoy it and I'm like incredibly entertained. But <laughs> I realize that perhaps this is like a slight bit of craziness in there that instigates me to do that. And so my question for you is, if you could pick out one little bit of craziness that you think puts you apart from the rest of the completely sane world, what would it be? I wonder if I should answer this question honestly or like make up some bullshit. You should probably just make up some bullshit because then you won't be embarrassed about it. Well, but then wouldn't this be a good thing to talk about anyways because it's kind of been sitting on your shoulders for a while. Yeah, but then everyone's going to know. <laughs> but that doesn't really matter because just whatever. Just, just, say the, just say the real thing because it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Like, Sarah, I heard Sarah does the same thing. I know, I know. <laughs> well, 
I don't know. I don't know if I can, I, I'll just try to, you know, maybe you should just talk about it metaphorically and they won't know what it actually is. And it'll just be like some sort of like weird meta kind of thing. No, that's so lame, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, yeah, uh, I just have this problem where I like play with my fingernails a lot. Uh, uh, this one's breaking. And the problem is I do it when I'm nervous, but then it makes me nor more nervous. It doesn't make you that nervous, you're lying. No, I'm not. <laughs> No, I'm nervous. Can't you tell? I'm like I'm like wobbling around. I'm like yeah, clearly everyone knows I'm nervous. No, they don't. You can't think. You only they only know because you told them because you're picking your fingernails. No, no, like they totally totally know. You're shaking. You're shaking. You're shaking on purpose to cover up the fingernail thing. No, no, I'm not. That doesn't even look real. Would it? Okay, smaller. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so sometimes I. I say things I don't mean, and I just wish I could be honest with everyone, but I'm a compulsive liar. Um, you're lying. No, 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 no. Not lying, not lying, because I'm lying about that, so therefore I'm obviously lying and I'm a liar. But just go with the fingernail thing, it's more believable. Okay, well, so I grow them out really long, and then Sometimes when I eat, I get lots of stuff stuck under there, and then it's kind of like this weird internal debate as to whether or not I look it out. Like, does the five-second rule apply to your fingernail, or is it different? Like, I don't know. Like, like there's something going on in here right now, but I don't know if it's food. Uh, I don't think I ate really recently, so if it is, it's probably more than five seconds. So it makes me a lot less nervous to look at my fingernails. I feel better now. All right, thank you so much to our wonderful Table Topics master, uh, Sarah, and, uh, and her res responders, Jenny, Nicole, and Marisa. Thank you, that was fabulous. Um, are, the, uh, are the evaluators ready to come and prepare, present their reports? Yes? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead um, and uh, uh, have our evaluators come up and talk about the four speakers. Um, while they're doing this, you might um, uh, uh, also recollect what the, uh, which, uh, start thinking about which speeches today of the four um, main talks uh, you thought were uh, most striking to you that maybe moved you the most. Um, as well as the, um, uh, they won't be talking about the table topics folks, but you can also be thinking about which of those you thought maybe deserved the, deserves an award today. And just a reminder, you'll be choosing one of the speakers and one of the table topics responders. So, um, but let me go ahead and introduce our first evaluator, uh, Merrill, who will be speaking about, um, uh, oops, I've forgotten. Oh, uh, she'll be talking about, uh, Adams, Adam, and Jean. Um, that was unexpected. So regarding um, Adam's reading my art history textbook piece, uh, I thought that you set up the concept very cleverly at the beginning, and I really felt like by the end of it, and throughout that there really was no way that, way that you could have failed, um, which was cool. Um, and something that I responded to, I guess personally, was the um, self-deprecating awkward quality that you had, both like in the way that you were kind of hunching over the, I can't do it because I'm not tall enough, but hunching over the mic and like kind of shuffling your things around and introducing the different things that you were going to try to do. Um, and I think I responded to that both as like empathically, it's like, oh, I'm feeling sorry for this character that you've created, slash maybe it's kind of you. Um, but also, I don't know, I, I'm kind of drawn to pay attention to that like type of performance. Um, so it like kept my attention very well, um, in spite of the what you were reading. Uh, something that I guess, <laughs> something that I guess um, you could improve maybe is um, finding a way to balance uh, the meta aspect versus the silliness, or maybe there isn't 
a way to balance that or that's part of it, I'm not sure. Um, but overall, it made me laugh a lot and I enjoyed it. And then on Jing's um, languages piece, uh, I definitely thought that you were going to ramble about the languages that you knew and wasn't expecting you to start speaking Japanese. Um, but something that I thought was really nice about it is even though I couldn't understand anything you were saying in the first two sections, the Japanese and the meowing, um, your expression and the way that you were looking and there was like a little twinkle in your eye was very engaging and I could tell that you were saying something, like I could tell that you weren't completely just saying every Japanese phrase that you knew, it seemed like you were thinking about something. Oh, okay. I just started recognizing the Japanese later and I didn't notice the transition. So um, I guess um, I have to say that the meow section, those were not some of your best meows, so that's my critique. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it also sounded like you were saying my name over and over again, which was really distracting. Um, I guess, <laughs> I guess something that you could improve is maybe talking more at the end, because I appreciated your reflection, but um, overall I was like, very engaged by your topic. Thank you for that great evaluation, Meryl. Um, next up, uh, Joaquin will be uh, evaluating uh, Lucas and Juliet's talks. There's fur in this booth, it's nice. Uh, on Lucas's speech or presentation, um, I find it really uh, engaging and interesting, mostly because I didn't, I had no idea that kind of thing existed. Um, um, uh, so it's very informatory, very enlightening. Uh, not sure if I would use it, but you know, to each their own. Um, as far as improvement, I think the PowerPoint itself could be improved. I think the background was a little bit bit too dark for me to read. Uh, though I think the screenshots, screen caps were very effective as to show what was offered. Um, and I'd like to see where you take that in terms of engaging with the material that you downloaded and see what projects you c comes from there. Um, and I'd uh, encourage you to not necessarily further explore the website, but further explore its implications. I think you brought up a really good point about issues of legality and th uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so think, maybe think about like who, tro who controls that website or who opposes it uh, and who has access to those kinds of materials or who tries to access them. And as far as Juliet, I think uh, when the stars align, uh, the, uh, it was very poignant, it was very touching. I think it's very you. It's, it's kind of a big build up and it led to a very nice message. I like the way that you started with the, uh, what was it, the this whole astrophys hourglass NPR thing, which I actually don't listen to them, but I've been told many times to do it, so maybe I do, I will now. And the story about the, the kids was very touching, and the way that you learn from, the way that you learn from us and the examples that you brought up. But uh, I suggest that you make it more, if that makes sense, if you continue exploring that, and maybe make it, in, again, make it into an art project or make it into some sort of written piece or can or take it further in some way. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much, Joaquin, for that great evaluation. If everybody could take a moment just to make sure, um, I would like on your ballots to go ahead and write down and clearly indicate um, uh, who you're voting for for the best speaker for today and for the best table topics respondent. And if, well, actually, if you wouldn't mind just running around and, or something. Yeah, if you could collect them, happy to collect them. What if we did vote for that person? For what? If we did, like, like I answered a question, would I vote them? Oh, you can vote for yourself. Okay. Or I'm just not going to vote for anyone. You can. <laughs> are you going to vote for anyone else for the, uh, for the, for the first part? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Just, 
Well, actually, there's going to be the grammarian and then. So um, while, uh, while our award master is tallying that up, we're going to hear from two more um, folks real briefly. Um, we're going to go ahead and hear now from Justina, our grammarian, who's going to talk a little bit about what she witnessed today grammatically. All right, um, some food for for thought for each of you. Um, Adam, you looked as though you had been dragged through a hedge backwards. <laughs> Lucas, for heaven's sake, let's dig our heels in and use the dark internet just for the hell of it. Jing, um, just remember to turn an honest penny and it is better to travel hopefully than to arrive early. <laughs> Juliet, um, if you think little things please little minds, you need another think. <laughs> um, Jenny, you brought the house down. Rachel, your delivery was as calm as a mill pond, and a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. <laughs> Marissa, feel free to share that story with the butcher, the bike, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And you were as entertaining as a cat on hot bricks. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Justina. Uh, next up, we're going to have our uh, joke master to kind of lighten the mood after all this evaluation. So please welcome uh, Sydney to the stage. Um, um, Adam, that's a really nice pencil, actually. I think I'm going to invest in that. But anyways, I'm supposed to tell a joke. We'll see how this goes. So... Um, this really old lady, she has like come to this epiphany. She realizes that she's seen and done almost everything in the world and there's nothing else to do, so it's time to pack up, get out of here. So, so she finds all these um, methods of committing suicide and she's not really sure what she's, gonna, what she's gonna do, but then she ultimately decides that she's going to um, shoot herself in the heart. So she calls her doctor to make sure she's really precise with it, doesn't miss anything, so it's a clean, clean takeout. So the doctor tells her that it's um, two inches below her nipple. So um, she takes careful aim. She, well, oh, she hangs up the phone to her doctor first. Then she takes careful aim, and then she shoots herself in the knee. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. Knee slapper, no. Um, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you, Sydney, for that uplifting joke. <laughs> um, So, um, Erica, do we have the, the tally yet? Yes, we do have the tally. Okay, so um, please welcome up uh, Erica, our award master. She's going to announce the winners today's. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations to everyone who used this lovely forum to share with us. And first, I will announce uh, the award for the best table topics response. And although it was a close call, uh, congratulations to Marissa, who uh, received the most votes. And please come up to accept your award. Slight technical difficulties. 
Congratulations, Thank Marissa. You. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, for the best uh, talk for the first part of our speech giving uh, was actually a tie. So um, we're gonna, uh, would, would you guys like prefer to conduct a tiebreaker or just have the two winners share? Two winners? Okay. Well, I'd love to welcome up to the stage Adam and Lucas. And you may share, <laughs> share this trophy, handmade, <laughs> out of this mesh paper. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, let's let's hear it again for for uh, both our speakers who were selected as well as for everybody else who presented their amazing talks um, today. Um, this is really fantastic. Um, uh, I, I, uh, does anybody have any final announcements or comments that they'd like to present before we head out? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm a junior, a junior art major, and I have to have my show before I leave because I'm going abroad next semester. So it's tomorrow evening uh, in the Dunn Gallery from 6.30 to 8.30, so you should just stop by. There'll be like snacks and stuff and juice and artwork, so come by. <laughs> Any other announcements? Yes. <laughs> um, also on Saturday from 12 to 5, KSPC is going to be in here doing a live broadcast. You guys should all check that out. Other announcements? No other announcements? All right, well, uh, well a couple more announcements just BESH related. Um, yes, we will indeed be having a wonderful afternoon with KSPC this Saturday from 12 to 5. Is that correct, 12 to 5? Yeah. So come on by or tune in, I guess, on what's the call number? Um, the website is 88.7. 88.7, okay, FM, yeah. So tune in, and then tonight, again, we'll be having our, uh, an abbreviated form of Diction for Dollars from 5 to 7.30. You can earn up to $20 um, by speaking uh, at a rate of a dollar a minute. And then at 8, we'll be having um, a bunch of wonderful speakers. We'll have Johnny Jungle Guts, who's a wonderful artist in town. We'll have um, Matthew Timmons, who's a wonderful uh, experimental writer and publisher. And we'll have UNFO, the Unauthorized Narrative uh, Freedom Organization. Uh, which is Harold Abramowitz and Amanda Ackerman, and they'll be pre presenting uh, uh, a, w a wonderful meditation as well. Hopefully, you know, everybody's probably getting a little, things are getting a little intense now, end of the semester, so we thought we'd program something that would hopefully be a little relaxing for you. So please come on by tonight. Um, that will go from, that part will go from 8 until a little bit before 11. So um, thanks so much, everybody, for taking part. I really appreciate your participation and, and being here and speaking. All right, thank you. Today and who has done Diction for Dollars before is receiving their very own Toastmasters of Fine Arts, a TMFA. So um, uh, uh, <laughs> next, next, um, next Thursday, a week, a week from today, um, if, you, if you can be here, we'll be doing an awards ceremony and we'll be, where we'll be um, uh, giving out our, your certificates. If, um, you know, you're not required to be here, but if, you, but if you'd like to be here to receive that and to toast with us. Um, some other bonuses is that there'll be some nudity that night and, some, and a lot of champagne, so. What is that? Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, December 6th, a week from today, next Thursday. And there will be diction for dollars.